right? If you don't take the time to walk this through, then we go all over the place and we implement crazy uh, policies based on old ways of thinking. And I was in, uh, in California not long ago and I said, you know, when I was younger, I was more nuanced. And I would say, I've got very complicated water laws here. <coughs> History is very complicated, and I can see why it's complicated. Now I just say, it's wrong. Your water laws were made at a certain time for a certain reality, and they don't work anymore, and your people are going to be dying or move out of your, your, your fish are dying, your animals are dying, your trees are dying. It doesn't work anymore. Scrap it. Get the right law. And I think that has to be our thinking, that the water laws in all of our provinces came out of another time and place and access to prior access, this privileged access to water that certain industries have, were come out of another time and place. And we have to say that that's not the, the, the that they don't serve the reality of the current day, they have to go and they have to change. So here are the four principles that I would I would offer to you. The first of all is that water is a human right. And you might say to me, well, that's a motherhood. And I will say to you, it was a tough fight at the United Nations, let me tell you. And Canada led the fight against the human right to water, much to my mortification, under the Harper government. <clears throat> they were the last country in the world to finally sign on to a, a statement that took place at Rio Plus 20, reluctantly and with no intention of fulfilling it. <clears throat> but it is a very important obligation and when we as a human species agreed that human right to water and sanitation were fundamental human rights we took a collective evolutionary step forward in my opinion and now it gives us the moral high ground upon which to build water policy and so everything you look at you can say what is the impact on the poor what is the impact on older people on children on first nations what is the impact on smaller communities? What is the impact? Uh, I mean, if you think that poor that water denial only exists in the global south, let me tell you about the 90,000 people who've had their water cut off in inner city Detroit, mostly African American, either seniors or single mothers, uh, because they cannot pay for their water. This is a scene coming to a community near us in the future if we don't grab a hold of this notion that water is a human right. And what that might mean here in Prince Edward Island for this struggle is that one of the obligations of this new right on all governments, whether they like it or not, whether they signed or not, is the obligation to prevent third-party destruction of local water sources. So I would like to see us start using this new resolution, this, this commitment of water as a human right against, for instance, fracking, against certain poisonings of our water, nitrates and so on, chemical fertilizers, when we, when we have the evidence. I think we can start to, to actually demonstrate that the human right to clean and safe water is violated when the water source itself is violated. Yes. The second principle is that water is the common heritage and a public trust. And what this means basically is that the water belongs to the people, it belongs to future generations, it does not belong to any privileged group, nobody has the right to appropriate it or compromise it for personal gain and any prior privileged access must end. There, we need to set up what's called a hierarchy of use uh, and then we have to say we're going to have, again based on certain principles, we're going to, in the name of this public good that belongs to all of us, we are going to have our government act as trustee. Uh, I worked in Gaino, I know, but it's possible and it has happened. I worked with the, uh, with the government in Vermont and they didn't have any protection for their groundwater and they had a lot of um, bottled water companies coming in and just pumping 24-7 and just ruining local watersheds. So a Republican state senator and a Democratic state senator, both women, introduced this bill that we worked on together and they declared uh, unanimously that the water is a public trust, but they also said that it had a hierarchy of use. And that is if there's any concern about it, conservation or, or overuse or whatever, water for people's daily needs, water for ecosystem protection, and water for, for local sustainable food production come first. Those are the principles that were adopted, and I believe that absolutely has to be placed in, uh, into the heart of any Water Act, and I would really hope that notion would guide the work that you do in your consultation. The third principle is that water has rights, too. 
And this notion takes it all step beyond public trust and says, outside of its usefulness to us, water has rights, nature has rights. And I was very excited to be part of a, an historic meeting in Porto Alegre, Brazil, where the, there was the 2009 Climate Summit in Copenhagen, which failed so badly, so and ended in, in total disaster. So President Evo Morales of, of uh, Bolivia invited a whole bunch of us to come to Bolivia, to Cochabamba, Bolivia. Did I say Brazil? I meant Bolivia. Um, and he, uh, he thought about two or 3,000 would come, 35,000 of us descended upon him. And out of that came the Universal Declaration on the Rights of Mother Earth, which is a very beautiful document about what rights the Earth has. It doesn't mean you can't go fishing, but it does mean you cannot fish a species to extinction. It doesn't mean there isn't a commercial use of water, but you can't harm the watershed, that there have to be limits to protect the rights of nature. It's an extraordinarily exciting concept a lot of us are working on. Um, and it was such a breath of fresh air, I, I, I went to Copenhagen, uh, and it was a brutal experience because they had police from all over Europe. By law, the government suspended civil rights, civil liberties, two weeks before, then during, and two weeks after, so they could pick anybody up, ship anybody off, put anybody in jail. It was appalling. They had dogs that they kept hungry. I know because I had a rented an apartment near where the police were keeping these dogs and they told me <clears throat> to keep them hungry so they're scarier to, to, to the people on the streets. It was really awful. But when you got off the plane in Copenhagen to go to this United Nations Summit on Climate, there was a, a, a whole raft of little people, I call them elves, dressed um, in Coca-Cola outfits. They were working for Coca-Cola, who give you a little Coca-Cola and welcome you to Copenhagen, or what they cutely call Copenhagen and which I came to call Copenhagen, because everywhere you went, it was like the UN Summit brought to you by billboards and videos and ads for Coca-Cola. When I left uh, Copenhagen, really angry, I remember, I did, I'm afraid I used the F word on the little house at home. <laughs> I'm sure she was paid minimum wage and doesn't drink Coca-Cola either, but so this notion that water has rights has a real applicability here in Prince Edward Island because what you're being told around this moratorium is that it's safe, that it's only a small discharge or recharge, that you know the science has been done, the science has not been done. We have to insist on the precautionary principle, which is part of the notion of the rights of nature. Only rights basically says that thought that we've had that water is a resource for our pleasure, convenience, and profit is wrong. That's the modern way of thinking about water, what a colleague of mine calls modern water. He, he quotes this guy who was, uh, who was advising uh, uh, the president of Hoover when he built the Hoover Dam, and he said America will be great when it conquers its water when it conquers its water through dams. And that notion of conquering nature, conquering water, is the root of the problem here. And we have got to change it. That's absolutely fundamental. So finally and fourth then, that, and the notion, the fourth principle that I would put forward is that water can teach us how to live together. Now what do I mean by that? Well, in a world where the demand for water is going straight up and the supply is going straight down, and that's what the arrows look like, let me tell you, it's conceivable that water is going to be a source of conflict and violence and potentially war. And in my book, I talk actually quite a bit about different areas around the world and the part of water play, including <coughs> Egypt, including Syria. There's a very important big water story uh, in the lead up to the conflict in Syria. Um, but there's equally a question then, if water is a source of war or conflict, could it not be nature's gift to us to teach us how to live with one another in a different way? And the whole concept here is water as a peacekeeper, water as a vehicle for peacekeeping. So when different sides with ancient grievances and ancient negative histories come together over a common threatened watershed, they can put those things aside and come together. And there are miraculous stories around the world where this is happening. It's kind of like the comet movies, you know, where the comets come into the earth and all of a sudden it doesn't matter very much what your difference is with everybody is that you're all going to die in 72 hours and they send Tom Cruise or somebody out to blow up the goodbye <laughs> Tom. Uh, well, we do have a comet coming at the earth. It is a kind of climate change 
water crisis that is here. And it's here in parts of the world first, but it's coming to a community near you, I promise you. And so the question then becomes, can we use this? Can we come together? I love the story of friends of the North and Middle East who are foreign factions that have been working together for decades, and they don't talk together about anything like religion or history or anything, because they know they won't agree, but they come together to protect the Jordan River and the Dead Sea. And they are very clear on what they need, and they just succeeded in getting a huge amount of water restored um, to, the, to the Jordan River and put together a cleanup of young people from all of the warring factions in the middle of the continued stress in that part of the world. So I look at that and I say, well, what might that mean with, for Prince Edward Island? Because I want to say this as strongly as I can. This isn't against farmers, my gosh. This has got to be farmers grow our food. Uh, and, and we thank them for it. But we have to collectively look after the water gift, the water heritage we've been given in this world and in this country and in this province. Because if we don't, it will hurt all of us. It will hurt all of the children of all of us in the next generations. We have to secure a, a safe, secure supply of water. And we, we have to leave this heritage for those who, who come after us and have as much right as we do to breathe clean air and drink clean water. And let me tell you, at the rate that we are destroying the water table in the world, <laughs> Uh, a lot of people are not going to inherit uh, a water heritage at all. But I just wanted to end by saying the numbers that came out tonight show that you guys do love water. We do love water in Canada. It doesn't yet, it's not yet reflected in our laws, but it's going to be in your hope. And the hope is also when I go in and speak to grade fours and fives and sixes, and these kids know all this stuff. They understand all this stuff. We are the stewards of water. You are, and we together, because you know, people from across the country are watching the struggle and in solidarity with you, are going to say no to the lifting of the moratorium. You are going to help transform this province to a province that engages in sustainable, long-term uh, uh, agriculture and food production that's sustainable for its water, for the health of its people because we have no option. We are the stewards. And I just want to paraphrase Tolkien. I will say here that we will have lived well if this island did still grow fair and bear fruit for, for fl and flower in the days to come. For we are the stewards. I thank you very much.